Well, this morning I want to invite you to simply turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to be in verse 19 through 25. And to kind of give you a little bit of background where we've been, over the last couple of weeks we've been looking at what it means to be the church. We've been looking at how the early church was not referred to as Christians, they weren't referred to as um, followers of Jesus, they weren't referred to as judgmental bigots, but they were referred to as simply the way. The early church had a very real understanding that they were, in fact, the way in which God used to point those who were far from him back to him. That the church was the instrument by which God was reconciling the world to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ. We looked early on how that, that 50,000 foot view of how we are a holy nation bought with his blood and sacrifice, that we are a chosen race, beloved and holy before his eyes. That second week, we looked at how Jesus called pastors to lead his people and what God expected of his pastors to be the first in service to him. Last week, we looked at how God has instructed deacons to partner with the pastor that we might meet the needs of the congregation head on that those who were in the congregation would have the needs met, that they would be loved and, and cherished. But now we look back on all of you. We turn our attention to the congregation, and we ask ourselves, what does God expect of his congregation? And the passage that we're looking at this morning is in the book of Hebrews, and it is probably one of my favorite passages to speak on whenever it is the topic of the congregation, the people of God, because I think it really does speak to what it is that we are called as the people of God to do. Now let's remind ourselves that the pastors and the deacons are not separate from the congregation. We are not elevated above the congregation. But the pastors and the deacons are a part of the congregation. So when we are talking about the congregation, we are talking about all of us working together for a common purpose, with a common confession, with responsibilities to one another. Now to give you a little bit of background about the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written in a time when people who had given up everything to follow Jesus we're beginning to struggle with that decision. You see, in their lives, they were being called to follow Jesus. And while they were told, <coughs> excuse me, while they were told that this was not going to be an easy road. In fact, tribulation and trials, suffering was going to be in their way. A lot of us, many of us, when we, when we were told about following Jesus, we heard that but somehow in our minds we expected something different. Yet these people were finding themselves facing real persecution, real trial, real suffering as a result of following Jesus. And as those persecutions were ramping up against Christians, things were getting tough and they were facing the temptation to turn back. They were facing the temptation to... Uh, for, and, and here's what's, I think, so important for us to understand. They were facing the temptation not to abandon Jesus entirely, but they were facing the temptation to compromise. If only they would soften their stance. If only they would just observe the cultural customs at the time. If only they would just integrate Jesus into what everybody else was doing. If they, only they would say, well, well, Maybe Jesus isn't the only way. If only they would compromise, the persecution would stop. But the author of Hebrews, and again, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. It's a book that is anonymous. 
And though many people throughout history have tried to, to say that they knew who wrote it, we really we, we don't know who wrote it. Likely very closely tied to the Apostle Paul. Maybe the author is Luke, the physician. But again, we don't know. But this author writes to warn them that you cannot straddle the fence between the way and the world. There is no compromise that is acceptable to God. You are either for Jesus 100% all in or you are for the world. But what I love about this book, and really if you want to think about it, it's just a really long sermon. It's not written as a rebuke. It's not written in anger. But it is written as an encouragement. And if the whole book can be summed up in a single phrase, it would be this, you've got this. And then the author goes on for 13 chapters, giving us all the evidence we need to know that we have this. Not because of anything we have done, not because of anything that we can do, but because of all of what Jesus has done for us, that we have all the evidence that we can to fully believe it and live it out. And one of the major themes that goes throughout this book is that you are not alone. In the very beginning, verse 1 1 says, You have Jesus living for you and through you. He is never going to abandon you. Even in verse chapter 1, verse 14, we are told that there are angels that are ministering to us and fighting for us. Chapter 2, 3, you have your salvation. 4, 12, you have the very word of God, which is living and active. It is able to penetrate even to our very souls. Chapter 4, verse 15, we're getting a little bit more specific on Jesus. You have a great high priest who has been able to sympathize with your weaknesses and has gone before you into the holy presence of God. We have a better covenant in chapter 8 that's by a better sacrifice that is Jesus on the cross. We have access to God, the very throne room of God. We can just approach whenever we want simply by bowing our heads and closing our eyes and speaking our heart in prayer. Chapter 12, verse 1, we have a great cloud of witnesses of the saints who have gone before us who by faith lived out the promises of God that we have just simply to reach out and grasp. And then throughout all of this, we are reminded that we have one another, the family of God, the church, and that we need to rely on one another and keep encouraging each other and to keep pushing each other towards Jesus. That is the background for our passage this morning. So let's read in chapter 10, starting in verse 19. Therefore, brothers... Now, in mine, there's a footnote there that says, or brothers and sisters, because we know that in the original Greek, the word brethren, adelphoi, included women. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, 
and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What this passage teaches us is that we are not alone, but we are connected. So our big idea this morning is, you are connected, so be connected to one another. You are connected, so be connected. The first thing that we learn from this is why we are connected. We are connected because of what Jesus did for us. In verse 19 and 21, we are told that we have confidence to boldly approach God, not because of anything that we have done, not because we are a part of this this club or, or, or group of people that have somehow made it, but we are connected because of what Jesus did for us. We are told that we have confidence to boldly approach God. And 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 I want you to see that this isn't an individual thing here. Throughout all of this passage, we've moved from the singular command, you, to let us, let us together boldly approach God. Why? Because of the blood of Christ. Always pointing back to the cross. Not because of anything we've done, but because what of what Jesus did. Because of the blood, blood of Christ. Christ by the new and living way. You see, in the old way, they had to gather together and they had to once a year rely on this high priest to come and take this bull and slaughter it after he had already atoned for his own sins so that he could atone for the sins of the people. And it was a very bloody mess. And it was only temporary. It had to be repeated over and over and over again. But this is a new and living way, which means that old way has been, is obsolete. We no longer need to bring the sacrifices of the blood offering each and every year because our new way is through the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. The old way is obsolete. So much so that now the, to sacrifice For the forgiveness of our sins is an abomination to God. By the new and living way. Through his flesh. Now we all know that the moral law of God required that we are holy. That we meet the requirements of God and that if we were to just fall in one specific instance of that law, one lie one little fib, one little adulterous thought in our heart, one little hatred of a brother, and we have transgressed the entire law. We are condemned before God. No one who has ever lived has ever been able to meet God's holy standard until Jesus. So we boldly approach not on the basis of who we are and what we have done, but we boldly approach based on Jesus who was born of a virgin and lived a perfect life and through his flesh never sinned. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that he made him sin who knew no sin that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. So because of that we get to have access to him. And he becomes that perfect priest who is constantly interceding for us and telling God that I have paid for their sins. Now, while this relationship is intensely personal to each one of us, it is never private. And the fact that we have a high priest speaks to that. Because in that early time, in that old covenant, they would gather together and they would rely on that priest to make atonement. And they would gather together recognizing that all of them had fallen short. But this priest connected them together. Paul talks about it in terms of adoption. Galatians 4, 4 to 5, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, under flesh, 
to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Adoption is about being part of a family. When you're adopted into a family, you who did not have a family now have a family, mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, grandparents who love you. But in that old covenant time, in the ancient time, Adoption carried more meaning. You see, the adopted sons and daughters had more rights than natural-born heirs. You see, a natural-born heir could be disowned if he didn't meet his father's righteous standards, but not so with the adopted children because they had given up everything behind them to be a part of this family. They could never be disowned, and that is the reality of our relationship with our Father. We can never be disowned because it's not based on what we have done, but what Christ did. We are all adopted into this beautiful family called the church. It's such a beautiful thing. But one of the biggest obstacles for people, for even those in the church, to see themselves connected in Christian fellowship is feeling like we don't have anything in common with other people in the people of God. They don't dress like me. They don't act like me. They have more money than me. They have less money than me. They root for the Raiders. (laughs) Or gasp, Ravens fans. Or maybe even... There are those psychopaths who don't even like sports. But here's here's the beauty of it. When we don't feel like we have anything in common, we are connected by the blood of Jesus. We are connected into this family because if we have nothing in common, we have a common brother a common Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, if by some chance this morning you, you've made it in here past five alarm clocks, losing an hour, and you made it this morning and you are not connected to Jesus because of what he did for us on the cross, may I plead with you to consider the message of reconciliation that is given to us in the message of the cross, that Jesus died for the sins of his people, that we might have access to God. Would you consider that this morning, connecting to the family of God? We are connected if only because of what Christ did for us. But we are also connected, number two, by a common confession of hope. We are common, we have this common confession of hope. And because of that, we draw together near. You see, there are are things in the Christian life, whether or not you are Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or even those who are the non-denominational people, who are basically just Baptists with cooler worship bands. Sorry, Josh. I was wrong. I apologize. We are a very cool worship band. But we have a common confession of hope. There are certain things that we all believe. We all hold together. Our common core convictions of God in three person, blessed Trinity. Jesus being fully and truly man and fully and truly God, that we are, and and this is our confession, that we are saved by grace through faith alone. We are connected by a common confession, and our confession is not one of judgment. In fact, it's the opposite. You see, there is no need for judgment because we already know that we have been judged and found unworthy by the law. The Ten Commandments have told us how far we have fallen short of that. We don't need to to say that we are 
judged. We know that. The hope is that we recognize that in spite of that, Jesus still died for us as sinners. Our confession is of hope. So in this case, let us draw near together. Let the church draw near. Not simply those who have earned the right. There are none that are super Christians who pray for four hours every day and read the entire Bible once a month, who have earned anything. We are all on even standing. That's one of the reasons why I want to remind us that pastors and deacons are still a part of the congregation. We draw near together. We gather together to worship the one true God. Let us gather together based on our confession of hope that guarantees that we are not only received and accepted into the very presence of God, but we are welcomed and loved. How beautiful is that? I always love when I come home from the office and without fail, the moment the door opens, I have squealing little girls running to me. No, God's not a squealing little girl, but when I approach his presence, he runs to us. He throws his arms around us and just welcomes us into his presence and invites us to pour out our hearts. He already knows what we've experienced that day, but he wants to hear it from us. You are welcome. You are loved by the confession of hope. We are sprinkled clean. We are washed in the purification of Jesus. And this, this speaks that those who are part of the family of God have been regenerated. We've been transformed by the power of the cross. We were once dead, but now we are alive in Christ Jesus. And this should immediately bring to mind baptism, that we should be following our confession of hope by baptism. The Bible knows of no unbaptized Christians. If, we, if you have made it this far and you have confessed that hope and you have not received baptism, that is next step. It does nothing for you spiritually, but it is an identification of obedience. That the entire church is purified and presented to God as holy. In a first series a couple weeks ago, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, or chapter 2, verses 9. But you are a chosen nation by the blood of Jesus. Holy. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And this is so beautiful that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have become a holy nation, a people who weren't a people. People who weren't a family, we have gathered together. We are one family. And then in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul is speaking to the pastors of the church in Ephesus. And he gives them some, this encouragement. Take care of the church. Take care of their needs. Take care, love them, feed them, care for them. Why? Chapter 20, verse 28, the book of Acts. Because in the Holy Spirit, he has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. He paid for us the greatest cost, his own life, that we might be joined together as the people of God. So what is our confession by way of application? What do we confess? It is to acknowledge that we, apart from Jesus, are lost. We are orphans without purpose and without hope. And that is the reality of those who are outside of the family of God, orphans without purpose or hope. But in Jesus, we find salvation for our sins and connection to a family and connection to a father who loves us. 
praise God. But in your family, if you have kids, you probably know that your, each family member has the responsibility to the family, certain responsibilities that they must fulfill. We wouldn't just let our kids just do whatever they want, destroy our houses like a tornado came through. They have responsibilities. My oldest, his responsibility is to clean her room, feed the dog, and feed the chickens. We have responsibilities. So in our family, in the family of God, we also have responsibilities. Number three, we are connected in responsibility to one another. Now, this is going to be hard for some people who have a consumerist mindset that I want to come to church, I want to sit, and I want to get out of here before I have to say anything or do anything for anybody. I'm just here to get my daily, my weekly song and worship, my weekly dose of the Word of God, and don't ask me for anything else. Two things Paul tells us, or it's not Paul. I always think of it as Paul, but it's not Paul. Two things that the author of Hebrews tells us that we are supposed to do for one another. One, stir one another up to love and good works. And two, meet together. As things get tough, we get discouraged. We feel like turning back and leaving behind the church of Jesus Christ. We, we feel as though we might need to compromise just a little bit. Not tell anybody about the way to God. Not stand firm on the foundation of God. Not feel like we have to just stand for those social issues in our society that everybody else has just said the church is not allowed to speak on that. But as things get tough, as things get discouraging, as we feel as though we are alone and need to turn back, that is when we stir one another up and we push each other or pull each other, kicking and screaming, back towards Jesus. We are responsible, we are responsible to one another. And we do that through encouragement. Again, the whole book of Hebrews is you've got this. We remind each other, you've got this. You are not alone. You have Jesus, you have the word of God. You have ministering angels that are fighting those spiritual battles that you don't even see. Oh, and by the way, I am with you as well. I'm praying for you. I'm here to be a shoulder to cry on. Even if we don't have anything else in common. Gosh, if you're a Ravens fan, I still have your back in Christ Jesus. But let's be honest. If you're not consistently meeting together, you don't have anybody's back. You cannot fulfill your responsibilities to God's people and your family if you are neglecting to make faithful worship attendance a priority in your life. Faithful life group attendance, faithful Bible study attendance, if you're not meeting together, I don't want to make this legalistic, but it's just the truth. I guess it's fitting that this, this sermon would fall on the lowest attendance worship Sunday of the year. There are so many reasons why this morning we could have neglected to get out of bed and come to worship together. That extra hour of sleep would have been beautiful this morning. We had every reason to stay in bed. Daylight savings time is the worst Sunday of the year. 
Daylight savings time is theft. They have stolen an hour of our lives. But if we're honest, this idea of stirring one another up to love and good works and meeting together is simply just a restatement of the one another passages in the New Testament. 47 times in the New Testament, these words, one another, are together. 47 times, they speak to instructions for the church, for unity, for love, for humility. Be at peace with one another, Mark 9.50. Don't grumble against one another, John 6.43. Be of the same mind with one another, Romans 12.16. Accept one another. Wait for one another. Before the beginning of communion, don't bite, devour, or consume one another. Don't eat at one another. Don't boastfully challenge or envy one another. Gently, patiently tolerate one another. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Seek good after one another. I'm not going to read them all, but they can all be summed up in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he said, Love one another. Love one another. You are responsible. And I can't put that any more strongly on each one of us, myself, starting with me. I am responsible to all of you. Not the least of which because you pay me to be. But even if you didn't, I have to do it anyway because I am responsible for the calling God has put on my heart and on my life. But the same is true of each one of you. You are responsible for one another. You are responsible to pray for one another. You're responsible to encourage one another. You're responsible to bear with one another one another. And yes, you are responsible to meet together. Prioritizing Sunday, but also throughout the week. We recognize that that early church, they didn't see the community of faith and the family of God as one to be simply one day a week, but every single day, day by day, sharing and breaking bread from home to home. They loved each other. You're responsible for your church family, your North Hills family. And I guess the million dollar question is, are we, that plural, are we doing enough? Are we doing enough to build up the family of God here at North Hills? By way of reflection this morning, what, I, what I'd love for us to think about is, is simply this, and again, let's turn it inward. You know, we've talked about the plural, and it's easy for us to point at other people, and we can say, yes, we're doing that because that person's doing this, but let's turn it inward. Let's make this personal. Personal that leads to the corporate. Am I doing all that's in my power to be connected to the people here at North Hills? Am I doing all that's in my power to make sure that each person in my family is taken care of, is prayed for? Have I done enough to make sure that those who have hurt me are forgiven and know they're forgiven? Are we calling out sin in our midst? We live in an age where membership and accountability to a local church is so out of vogue. People don't want to sign a covenant that says they're responsible because they just want to be able to drop in. 
But even later on in the book of Hebrews, verse chapter 13, verse 17, even here it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls. How can you submit to your leaders without knowing what you're submitting to? You submit to those who give watch over your souls, overseers. And while you don't always agree with what they do, you're still called to submit because we are one family loving and caring for each other, praying for each other. Are we doing enough? Because not only are we responsible to those in this room, but we are responsible for those outside of the walls of this place. Responsible to bring the message of Jesus to them because guess what? They're not coming to us anymore. Maybe every once in a while someone finds themselves in this room hearing the message of the gospel and responding to it. But outside the walls there is a broken and desperate world filled with orphans without purpose and hope who need to be invited in to the family of God. Are we doing enough to connect others to our family? Because in the family of God, we become one. We move from me to we. We move from selfishness to selflessness. We move from them to us. Let us do all that we can in our power to be connected to the people of God. For Amanda and me, the church has always meant so much more than just a place to gather because we find ourselves here 3,000 miles away from our closest biological family. So for us, you all have become our family and you've welcomed us in and we are so grateful and honored to be a part of your family. We are so grateful for the grandparents that Love our kids as though they are your own grandkids. Brothers and sisters that call us brothers and sisters. Parents who look out for us, who correct us when needed, but are always there. We're so grateful for all of you, and we hope that moving forward, as the people of God, the congregation, that we would do everything in our power, that that would be the story of every single person who is a member of North Hills, that they would have the love and care of a family that stirs them up to love and good works and pushes them to connect to Jesus. Let's spend some time reflecting on this this morning and maybe ask yourself, am I doing enough? Am I doing all in my power to connect with the people of North Hills? And if you're not, take it a next next step further and ask yourself, what can I do more to connect to the people here at North Hills? Thank you for watching. We hope this message has encouraged you as you seek to love God, serve others, and change the world. Check us out on our website, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel in order to receive more updates and resources from North Hills. God bless.